Good evening and thank you for joining us. Fort William Historical Park is dealing with the aftermath of another major flood on the property. The popular tourist attraction has been forced to close after the Kaministiqua River rose over the banks around the fort this past weekend. The water levels have now receded, but with more rain in the forecast, that could change again. Mitchell Ringo's reports. This dramatic drone video was released this week by Thunder Bay resident David McGowan. It's unclear when exactly the footage was recorded, but it shows the Fort William Historical Park submerged in flood water. It's believed the water levels peaked on Saturday. No one from the fort was authorized to do interviews about the situation, but a spokesperson with the Ontario Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture says the fort started experiencing flooding on its property late last week. But since then, water levels on the Cam River and across the fort property have receded significantly. The ministry spokesperson says fort employees are now on site completing the necessary cleanup for the park to reopen, and they look forward to welcoming visitors back very soon. It remains closed to the public at this time, and farm animals have been relocated to higher ground. Fort officials are working closely with regulatory authorities, including the Lakehead Region Conservation Authority and Ontario Power Generation, to continue to monitor water levels across the region's watershed. OPG production manager Dwayne Korchak provided an update on the Cam River. Things have definitely gotten better. Um, they have uh, the ability to monitor the elevations at, at Fort William Historical Park, and, and so can we now. So we're kind of sharing that information. And uh, yeah, things are, are definitely looking better. Uh, still a ways to go. And uh, we continue to monitor really closely uh, where we're at. The fort was built on a floodplain in 1972 and has flooded at least five times since 1977. When we spoke to fort officials a month ago about the potential for another flood, they were optimistic that the spring melt was going slowly. However, contingency plans were put in place to move all valuables and historical artifacts off the grounds to prevent any potential water damage. And all the farm animals were ready to move to another location if river levels began rising. Mitchell Ringos, TBT News. A second arrest has been made in connection with a shooting death at a Pearl Street home this past weekend. 49-year-old James Howard Halverson has been charged with first-degree murder and breach of an undertaking. On Sunday night, a 41-year-old city man was found inside the Pearl Street residence with serious injuries and was later pronounced dead at the regional hospital. The victim's name hasn't been released by Thunder Bay Police. The initial investigation led to the arrest of 44-year-old Jamie Osmar on first-degree murder charges. Police said there were two other suspects, and on Monday, officers detained multiple people on Ambrose Street. Halverson's arrest wasn't announced until today. A third suspect is still at large, and the investigation continues. But just two weeks ago before the provincial election, two, two of the leaders of Ontario's major political parties will be making a campaign stop in Thunder Bay in the coming days. NDP leader Andrea Horvath is scheduled to be in the city tomorrow and Friday. According to the party officials, Horvath will attend a private meeting with Indigenous leaders tomorrow evening. That event is closed to the media and the public, but she'll then attend two public campaign events on Friday, one in the morning to talk about gas prices and another in the afternoon to address the city's opioid crisis. Meanwhile, it's believed that Liberal Party leader Stephen Del Duca will make a campaign stop in Thunder Bay on Sunday. No details have been released at this point. PC leader Doug Ford has been campaigning in Andrea Horvath's home territory today. Siobhan Morris has the latest details from the campaign trail. This is Andrea Horvath's turf, the home riding of the Steel Town Scrapper. It's in Hamilton. Doug Ford stressed a progressive conservative message that they work for workers. Hamilton has a, a very, very proud history of manufacturing might. Ford trumpeted one steel plant's $1.8 billion growth plans to make greener steel and met with workers at another. Campaigning in Kingston. When it comes to Doug Ford, look, that guy is not a friend of working people. Horvath was highlighting her party's pharmacare plan, but says Ford's delay in raising the minimum wage and capping public sector wage bumps are less than worker-friendly. When a premier refuses during a global pandemic to provide 
the basic necessity of paid sick days for working people so that they don't have to go to work uh, and expose their co-workers to COVID-19, <laughs> that is not a premier who supports working people. Honestly, I think Andrea Horvath is running scared, but she, she gave up on the workers a long time ago. Ford dismissed Horvath's attacks and suggestions workers might need more help. When things are thriving in the economy, this is an employee's market right now. You know, you can get a job in any single sector you want. You can almost determine uh, what, you, what you need to fill that job. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stephen Del Duca is trying to give workers more flexibility to stay home after welcoming a baby with a financial top-up. Make sure that all of the gaps that might exist for some workers in this province relating to 18-month parental leave would be filled. The Liberals say it would mean as much as an extra $255 a week. That you could invest in raising your family, that you could invest in building a quality of life and building a future for yourself and for your family. The Green Party leader and his candidate for Parry Sound Muskoka picked up the endorsement of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. I'm inspired by OSSTF's vision about schools as community hubs, places full of people who care for children, who care for each other. The Greens have called for increased funding of schools to ensure better supports, including in special education. Tonight we continue our local coverage of the Ontario election as we meet another candidate in Thunder Bay Superior North. Lise Bourgeois is the NDP nominee for the riding for the second time. Vasilios Bellos has tonight's candidate profile. Lise Vaujois came very close to winning her first provincial election run in Thunder Bay Superior North in 2018. She was narrowly defeated by just over 800 votes, losing to longtime Liberal incumbent Michael Gravel. Vaujois says that it was difficult to come so close last time, but remains confident in herself and the NDP platform. So I've been looking forward to running again, and the team has been looking forward to uh, running with me. Uh, I feel very ready for this job, and I think that the NDP platform is also very strong. Vaujois has an extensive background in education with a master's degree and PhD in the field, something Vaujois believes will help her tackle one of the most discussed issues throughout the pandemic and this election period. Disastrous cuts to education take place before the pandemic started. Once we were into the pandemic, then it was, you know, things, things got quite a bit worse. We know how hard it's been for kids to be learning online, but the Ford government actually was already trying to impose online learning to young, on young kids. Vaujois says along with education, public services, including ensuring healthcare staffing and fair pay, are also an important part of her platform. Vaujois concludes by stressing the NDP will be the best party to represent Thunder Bay Superior North and Ontario as a whole. This party has always been pushing for social justice pushing for fairness, pushing for quality public services. We know that the Conservatives are not doing that, and that's been quite explicit. And we also know that the Liberals had quite a long time in power when they didn't improve those services. Vasilios Bellows, TVT News. Turning to the pandemic now, there's no change to the number of COVID-19 cases at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre today, but the number of patients in the ICU has declined. There are still 32 COVID-positive patients at the regional, the same number as on Tuesday, but the number of COVID-19 patients in intensive care has dipped from 5 to 3. The hospital is more than 104% full, and the ICU occupancy rate has dropped to 77%. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting 99 new cases since its last update on Monday. There are now 300 active cases, up from 243. But the latest incidents and test positivity rates are both down substantially. There were nearly 203 cases per 100,000 people in the district last week, down from 292 a week earlier. And the positivity rate dropped from 24 to 17.7%. Over in the Northwestern Health Unit, there are now 156 active cases, 
More than 80% of those are on reserves in the Sioux Lookout area, where there are currently 127 known infections. The health unit's seven-day test positivity rate is now 14.8%. A roughly $2 million construction project has begun on James Street. The work should take about two months to finish. In the meantime, drivers are asked to take alternate routes and use caution when in the area. Crews were on site today, blocking off the stretch of James from Victoria Avenue to Donald Street, with only local traffic allowed from Donald to Arthur Street. The work involves new piping being laid to connect with storm sewer lines flowing to the Nibin River. Later on, there will be water main work, road resurfacing and the, additional of, or the addition of bike lanes. Sidewalks on James will be open for the duration of construction, but city engineers say closing the roadway to vehicles is necessary for a project of this nature. Avoid James Street at that intersection as best you can. There's, there's Mount Dill to the west. There's, uh, we encourage people to go to Edward to the east, try to stay off of Leland if you can. Um, stuff like that. It's just, you know, by, uh, you know, basically be aware of what's going on. It's a it's a deep excavation, so there's not a lot of places for us to direct traffic down that right away. So shutting the road down completely was important. Newman says the work is likely to take eight to ten weeks to complete. Cambrian Players is presenting a story most people, th most people know, but flipping the script with this rendition of Alice in Wonderland. Let the jury consider! There's a great deal to come before that. This will be Cambrian players' third and final play of the season. The production features a talented group of local actors and crew with some even double cast. Alice in Wonderland was first a novel and then a play originally written in 1915. It was most recently adapted in 2020 by Andrea Jacobson with Thunder Bay's Come Play With Me Digital Theatre. Cambrian Players director Thomas McDonald says they've now taken that adaptation one step further and this won't be the Alice that local audiences have come to expect. So we have taken a bit of a different idea. Alice isn't a little girl. Alice is a senior in our production. And it's about what happens when the memory begins to fail. Uh, so much of Alice is about identity. It's about belonging. It's about time. And that's very different for a senior at the center of the story than it is for a child. It's been incredible. It's an amazing, amazing group of local performers. Um, we've been rehearsing for a few months now and we're just really excited to bring a little bit of a twist on Alice in Wonderland to Thunder Bay. The play opens this evening and continues each night until Saturday with five more shows next week. Tickets are available online at eventbrite.ca, but some of the performances are already sold out. Thunder Bay Television is kicking off a very special series tonight. The Real Memories of the Lakehead Group has produced three episodes called News from the Giant, featuring local newsreel footage from the 1950s and the 1960s. The Thunder Bay Museum launched the big project more than two years ago. The Real Memories team has was recruited to restore and digitize hundreds of reels of vintage news film, which was donated to the museum by Dougal Media several decades ago. The result is a series of eight vignettes, which each tell a story of the Lakehead's past. Those vignettes were then compiled into three half-hour episodes. The series will air tonight, tomorrow and Friday at 7 p.m. on CKPR Thunder Bay right after TBT NewsHour. Yeah, you won't want to go anywhere.